so I, this is my disclaimer that the regulatory lawyers make me give um, that these are my personal views and not necessarily the views of my company. So um, I'll quote our friend who's I think not in the room right now but will be joining us for the panel, Jonathan Richmond. Social media, um, Twitter is like walking into a cocktail party where there are a lot of conversations going on at once. Sometimes you walk in, walk past them. Sometimes you want to join in. Sometimes you just sort of, uh, you know, try to eavesdrop and figure out what's going on. Um, and very few people stay at the corner of a cocktail party and shout out their message while ignoring everybody else. And I think this is what scares lawyers about social media. They like to be the party that's in the corner controlling the message and uh, shouting out the message while uh, ignoring everybody else. They like to have that, um, that modicum of control. So pharma's concerns range from you know, the things we've heard millions of times, adverse event reporting, what's gonna happen if you hear adverse events. You know, I don't know what's suddenly different now that you might be receiving adverse events on the internet as opposed to the way you're receiving them now. Um, you know, for me and my company, we have a um, as you hear it, when you hear it policy, and I don't think that that would be any different. Um, you know, if, if you're hearing something in, uh, in Twitter or uh, on Wikipedia or something, you know, anything else, um, our policy would be the same regardless. So I, I think that that's um, not as valid a concern as it's been made out to be. Uh, obviously, off-label discussions are a huge issue for companies right now. Uh, my company happens to be one that is not currently under a corporate integrity agreement, which is nice for us, but uh, you know, we're kind of a dwindling breed out there. Um, and I think there's been uh, a huge focus on off-label discussions, but I think you have to keep in mind, and we'll talk about this again later on with the panel, um, where that level of control rests. Is it a sponsored site? Is it something that you've created and you're funding or you're sponsoring? Or is it just you know, a forum or a blog or um, a side wiki entry, which we'll talk about again in a little bit? Um, and what else are they worried about? Again, it's that level of control. Um, pharma companies and, and medical legal regulatory, I've found, are, um, you know, and frankly, we as lawyers are control freaks. We like to have control over our messaging. We like to know that it can't be altered. We like to train people and keep them in their little boxes as to what they can say and what they can't say. And social media, frankly, is scary. Um, you know, I, I talk to other lawyers who are, who are in our regulatory group. Um, none of them have comb-overs, by the way. All the regulatory lawyers at my company happen to be women. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and a lot of them are, frankly, very unfamiliar with what social media is and how it's used. And I think that fear of the unknown leads them down that path where they think, if I don't understand it and I, I can't get, wrap my head around it, then I'm just going to say no. I, I just, I can't, I, I, I don't have any more room in my brain to figure out another way of communicating. The old way has worked for a long time. You know, you have these one-on-one -on -one interactions where you're showing, um, you know, uh, a, a master visual aid or even on a tablet computer, you're showing, you know, your, your uh, prescribing information is right there. You're making sure that they, they get that message. And frankly, they're afraid of moving to a model where there is less control, uh, less certainty. So again, this is a stat we've seen a lot in the last few days, and this is another reason why I, I really think that the adverse event issue has been completely overblown. How many times do adverse events reported online actually result in reportable adverse events per FDA? There was that one in 500 that we heard yesterday. And Mark Monso from J&J, &J, who's had the J&J, &J, by the way, blog for, I think, between 18 months and two years now, has said that he has never received an adverse event on the blog, uh, either in comments or, or otherwise. And they do much the same thing that my company does. We would report it the same as we would, the requirement would be the same regardless of the medium in which the, uh, the adverse event is delivered. So in summary, obviously, adverse event reporting and off-label product use User-generated content is either not allowed or very tightly controlled. Um, you know, we've talked about the YouTube where no commenting is permitted, um, or people who, pharma companies who are on Twitter, who have basically used it as an announcement channel. Um, you know, uh, Pfizer News is, is putting out their press releases and other information. They're not necessarily following other users. They're not actually participating in that conversation. It's just another mode for, um, you know, for, for blaring things out or yelling in the corner of the cocktail party. 
Um, and again, this many-to-many -many communication is what concerns um, your, your legal and regulatory folks. So how do you fix it? You know, you have to experiment and you have to know the, um, know the level of knowledge of your medical legal regulatory team. Um, you know, for me, again, it's kind of an, an oddity, I think, when people say, well, wait, you're a lawyer and, and you like social media and you think that's okay, but how do, you, how do you stay within the lines? I think there are a lot of ways that you can stay within the lines. And again, we're gonna go into more detail with, uh, with Eileen and John in a little bit. Um, and, you know, they, they don't, um, Without the, without the specific FDA guidelines, which again, we don't have right now, and um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly skeptical that, uh, that we will have them by the end of 2010, despite what was said at an uh, e-patient conference last week, um, you know, that we're gonna have specific guidance around social media in the near future. So how do we take the, um, the information that's out there right now, the guidelines that are out there right now, and leverage those to be able to mount effective social media campaigns? Um, there really should be ways to manage these issues, and that's what we're going to talk about. So, um, just as a little regulatory background, and again, I, I apologize if this is a repeat of information, um, but I think it, it really sets the stage for where we are and, and what's going to happen with respect to the hearings that are happening next week. Um, just a show of hands, how many people in the room are, are attending the social media hearings? Okay, so a few. Um, we've seen that the participation uh, in presentations by industry is fairly low. Um, I think uh, John, or John posted a statistic that it was 7%, I believe, was, was industry versus the rest um, agencies and other, uh, you know, other parties affiliated with pharma. Um, my company chose not to present at this time and to submit comments after the hearing. Um, again, that was, that was a decision that was made in a working group that, that we have amongst the people who are attending the meeting. Um, I'll be attending as well as someone from our regulatory, uh, our actual regulatory function and one of the regulatory attorneys. Um, but the company just decided that it was, it was probably more prudent to listen to what everyone else had to say and then submit comments. I, I don't necessarily agree, but um, you know, that's kind of where the company is at right now. So, again, you know, when you're talking to your legal regulatory folks, they're dealing with these things. They're dealing with no real guidance from the FDA. They're dealing with guidance for, you know, traditional promotional methods that have been around for decades now. They're worried about the untitled letters that went out in March and April because all of the sudden FDA seemed to wake up and say, oh my gosh, there's an internet, wow, check that out. Um, they don't necessarily trust social media. They, you know, they, they may have kids or grandkids who are on MySpace or Facebook and hear you know, all of those stories that get elevated in the media about how accounts get hacked and you know, all of the negative things that are associated with social media. And they're also, frankly, again, concerned about control. They're worried about this unprecedented ability that social media has to connect with any user, anywhere, anytime, and that their content might be reproduced or forwarded or, uh, you know, or changed in some way through those methods, reaching all of those people. So um, how many of you have played, or seen, played with or seen SideWiki so far? Okay, so that's a, good, that's a good percentage. Eileen was kind enough to provide me with this example of a comment that, that she submitted on the Allegra website. Um, and, and frankly, um, you know, this is one of those things that again makes, makes legal and regulatory folks kind of lose their minds because they're, you know, they're worried about, um, you know, the comment might not be as nice or helpful or complimentary as Eileen's comment was. Um, you know, there, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of people out there who are making comments regarding uh, lawsuits and corporate integrity agreements and other things that, um, you know, the pharma companies might not necessarily want to have appearing to anyone who goes to the front page of, you know, any product website or the company's website. So, again, the question is, can you use that effectively? Can you monitor it? Will Google be providing pharmaceutical companies with a way to um, block that information or monitor it? Um, just a quick review, and again, I'm not going to stand up here and, and lecture you. I went through law school and that was really enough.